Hello and welcome to CT Vets Connect, the official podcast of the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm your host, Brian Scott Smith, and coming up in this edition, we find out how and why it's important for veterans to have their voice heard at the legislative level and how to do that. Plus, Connecticut Vietnam veteran turned author Ron Farina talks to us about his new book coming out later this year called Sacrifice that delves into the lives of military personnel who deliver the sad news to families when they lose a loved one and the heartbreaking stories from those families, friends and loved ones of fallen soldiers as they revisit their loss and their sacrifice. But first, I sat down with two members of the Department of Veterans Affairs here in Connecticut to get some updates on stories we covered in the first podcast and to talk about the new legislative session. Commissioner, as always, great to see you. Brian, you also. And on behalf of our team at Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs, we welcome you back. Yeah, a second podcast. I understand the first one went down well. Of course, we talked about many things last time, and we're going to do a little bit of an update, which is nice, from that previous one. So I'm just going to sort of like let you go, and we're going to talk about a few of them in depth. Sure. So the first thing I'd like to briefly talk about, very important to us, Brian, and that was we had six unclaimed remains. So we did a dignified ceremony in November, we had a very big turnout to be able to lay those veterans to rest. So we were pleased to be able to participate in that event. That was done at the Middletown Cemetery, I recall, because I was actually there reporting on that. And it was a beautiful ceremony, a gorgeous day as well, I recall. And as you said, very, very well turned out. To give a little bit of background on that, the various funeral homes across Connecticut work to advise, obviously, about the unclaimed remains. And then the ceremony is put together together so that, you know, they receive the dignity and respect that, of course, those individuals deserve. We've established a really good relationship with the State Cemetery Association, State of Connecticut, and sadly, some of these remains have been there for a long time. I believe the oldest set of remains was, you know, about 50 years in this last group that were interred. But the good thing is, of course, as we say, they've finally been given the dignity and the respect, and, you know, uh, yes, it may have been some time, but they've been recognized, and ultimately, that is the most important important thing, isn't it? And I know for you and obviously for the team, obviously, at the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs, lots of events as well in support of of Veterans Day. Talk to us a little bit about that. We had several requests on Veterans Day to deliver speeches in different communities. We had an event here on campus for our residents to attend. We also had an event in the cemetery itself. Again, another well-attended event. The Middletown Vets Council hosted the one in the cemetery. And then up here, we hosted our event. And the culminating part of that event was a ribbon cutting ceremony at a beautiful pavilion that we had a very generous donor that donated a significant amount of money. And we were able to put together a pavilion. Concrete pad is 20 by 40 feet with a permanent roof on it. It has a fan in it, lighting. It has an outdoor grill and a fire pit. So we're very happy to have that. We'll be looking forward to good weather for that to be used this year then. Absolutely. And talk to us about the fun run as well. So the town of Rocky Hill every year does an annual event to raise funds for the Rocky Hill school system. This year, they were having a little bit of difficulty doing it on the local streets in town. So they asked us if we could possibly host it on the campus. We were really excited to be able Able to do that in November. It was a little cool on that particular day. It was towards the end of November. Another well-attended event, and we are going to host the event again. We're going to try to shift it to the springtime. So towards the end of April this year, we're going to host the same event. And it's all about combining the population in the Rocky Hill area, blending it with our veterans that some are on campus as residents and others are veterans that are out in the community. We're going to ask them to come together and either walk, run, or put a backpack on and it'll be approximately five kilometers. For people who haven't actually visited the campus, they really should because it is a beautiful campus here Mm -hmm. at Rocky Hill and it's got beautiful buildings, beautiful grounds, very safe as well. I mean, obviously that's the other important thing we need to emphasize is we don't want anybody who's like having accidents or incidents sort of thing. So the campus just suits itself very well for that. Some really good news I hear about wreaths across America. We touched upon this in the last podcast. There was a push to make sure that every veteran received a wreath. I understand that happened this 
time. Miracles do happen. We were very nervous. It was our first time. Lindsay, who will join you shortly, was helping to coordinate that with our board of trustees. And we were very nervous around the September, October timeframe, realizing that we needed approximately 13,000 wreaths. And we had a couple thousand at that point. We're hoping your podcast helped get the word out when we talked about it and some of the other social media things that we did. But yes, we had a great ceremony in early December and we were able to put 13,000 plus reefs in between Colonel Gates right across the street from the facility here in Rocky Hill and our state veteran cemetery down in Middletown. Well, that is absolutely great news. And obviously uh, we'll be hoping that that happens again this year, 2024. We've got some time to go, but it's never too early to mention, obviously, about getting those wreaths paid for and making sure that every veteran again gets a wreath. Let's talk about the Veterans Hall of Fame as well, because that's another big, important event that you had. 11 distinguished veterans inducted in January. Explain what the purpose of the Veterans Hall of Fame is and why it's so important, obviously, to the department. A little brief history. It was established approximately 19 years ago, and this year we received several applications, and a committee got together and did the final vote, and 11 were selected. Your initial thoughts on the the word Veterans Hall of Fame is you immediately think that it's all about having someone that has served in the military with a real distinguished military career. That's just a little part of it. The criteria is to have served any rank, any service, and be honorably discharged. There's no length of time required. It's just, you know, having an honorable discharge and a DD-214 that says honorable service on it. The most important parts are what did you do after you served? in the military to support civic activities and what did you do to advocate for our veteran population. These 11 have incredible life stories and spending their entire life doing civic as well as advocacy for veterans. They belong to several different organizations. One gentleman prepared thousands of meals at a soup kitchen to serve in his local community. Others ran explorer, police explorer type organizations. One did community fit their former commanders of VFWs and American legions. Incredible to read the different contributions they've made. The biggest one is, you know, giving of their precious time. That's a big part of it. Hundreds, thousands of hours, in some cases, just decades of service. I think it just upholds the ethos of the military and veterans in that they're always there, you know, whether they're in the military or not, always giving back to their communities. We are tweaking our application process a little bit. We want to get it out there early, and we are hoping for a lot of applicants this next year, and we plan on doing the induction ceremony around the same time next year. So in January of 2025. So people can sort of recommend people for this. Can yes. They? Excellent. Korean and Vietnam ceremonies across the states. Yes. Uh, so the lieutenant governor, and this goes back to when Lieutenant Governor Beisowitz was the secretary of state, she started to acknowledge World War II veterans with a certificate and she would make remarks and the commissioner would make remarks at these ceremonies and let the veterans speak about their experiences. Since I came on officially in June, I've done approximately 30 of these ceremonies around the state of Connecticut. And right now we are focusing on the Korean vets as well as Vietnam vets. It's a welcome home for the Vietnam vets. And again, with the Korean vets, we present them with certificates. We give the Vietnam vets a lapel pin. Lieutenant Governor makes remarks. I make some brief remarks and then we do photos with them and we have them step up to the mic if they would like to talk about their service and their experience. So these are very awesome events. In some cases, it's the first time a veteran actually stands up and talks to anybody about their experience. Pretty emotional. I was going to say emotional was the word I was going to use because these stories are challenging stories to to listen to, but they are so important for not just military audience, but for non-military audience to obviously hear as well, because despite what we see in our media and on television in places around the world, it affects everybody. And it's just, I think, understand what these men and women go through in service, obviously, to their country, which leads us on to our next piece, which is about a national epidemic of loneliness and isolation. Because sadly, so many veterans either lose family and find themselves lonely and isolated. But it is something that is being addressed, isn't it? It is. It's now an international issue. Some will say it's an epidemic. In Connecticut, the lieutenant governor and governor, they're taking the lead and they're trying to get the message 
message out about how to connect socially. I was asked to attend a press conference and speak on behalf of, you know, what our team at Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs is doing to try to bridge some of those and make some of those connections so people don't feel isolated. The number that I wasn't aware of, I believe the governor brought this up, out of the, you know, 3 million plus population in Connecticut, there's about a million people, no exaggeration, that live alone. So 30% of the population in Connecticut live alone. Which is a big figure. And at the end of the day, nobody should be alone and isolated because we all need some form of relationship, friendship, the ability to connect with others. So it's great that obviously the Department of Veterans Affairs is there, obviously for veterans Mm -hmm. and their families, etc. And good that the state is also looking at this matter. And let's hope that uh, we can hear some further good news as we do more of these podcasts as to, you know, how that program progresses and what sort of resources and things are made available for obviously the individuals concerned, not only here in Connecticut, of course, but as you said, across the nation as well. The legislative session has, of course, started, which means it's a busy time for everybody, all agencies. And of course, the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs becomes busy as well because of that. Just give us a a quick idea of how that affects the workings, as it were, of the agency and, and obviously your team. Sure. So we try to weave some of our priorities in. And one of them is to make sure that every municipality is doing what they need to do in accordance with the state statutes, and that's have a municipal veteran representative. And that goes back to the social isolation. If that veteran representative is out there and all 169 municipalities, that is the go-to person so that veteran can understand what programs and services are available, you know, some potential tax benefits for those that are severely disabled. We have met with several members of the Veterans Committee throughout this past, you know, five or six months in preparation for this short session that's going to happen to try to identify issues that are out there that affect our veterans and, you know, trying to get everybody on the same sheet of music and really focus on what's important and addressing those items. A lot of work for everybody concerned. As, and again, it is a short session because obviously it is a, a major election year. And I suppose the closing point on that commissioner is if anybody out there wants to have their voice heard, then again, just contact the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs with whatever concerns they have and hopefully it might be something that uh, you can take up or you may already be dealing with. As always, it's good to catch up with you. Thank you for these updates. Some great news there, which is always good to hear and we'll look forward to speaking to you again, obviously, in the next podcast. But in the meantime, Commissioner, thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Brian. Joining us now is Lindsay Jessup, who's Manager of Community Advocacy here at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Lindsay, I think this is your first time on the podcast. This is, so thank you very much for having me. Not at all. Lindsay, tell us a little bit, and the Commissioner alluded to this when we were speaking to him just a moment ago, obviously short legislative session, but still plenty of work to be done by you and the team here. So let's trip through as much of this as we possibly can. Commissioner obviously mentioned about the municipal veterans representatives. Just Tell us a little bit more about that, because that's important, because people need to know who to go to and where they can find them. So as the commissioner pointed out, every city and town in Connecticut is meant to have a municipal veterans representative. And that is a person that the town selects. It can be done on a voluntary basis to have that person at a very local level be able to point veterans in the right direction related to services, how to connect them to federal services, how to connect them to state services on the very local level, who they can go to for those services. And it's important that veterans have people in their town that know those services. So that's really a big push for us here at the department is to make sure that every town does have a municipal veterans representative. And that's done a lot by our Office of Advocacy and Assistance here. And that is managed by John Carragher. Any veteran listening finds that they don't currently have a veteran representative, then obviously they should contact the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs. So that they can obviously be guided as to where they can get some information. Absolutely. We're always happy to be a resource for veterans and veteran families. You know, certainly if there's an issue, we're happy to reach out to that town and kind of figure out where they're at in terms of getting a municipal veterans representative on board. And again, just making sure that they are working towards that. Commissioner mentioned letters were just sent out to every town and municipality, re-emphasizing the importance of it and not only the importance of it, but the actual requirement in state statute. We always mention 
mentioned the website, I understand it's going to get a little bit of an upgrade. Yeah, and we're getting a lot of help, obviously, from the state with that, from DAS and their team at BITS to really help modernize our website and make it user-friendly, accessible. And again, it's so important, a veteran or anyone going to our website can access the information with just one or two clicks and they're not searching for it. I think as state agencies, we have so much information. So much information has to be public facing that over years, our state websites have just become buried and layered with information and they're not easy to navigate. So this is really the state's push to help modernize websites to make sure it's accessible across the board. They all have the same look and feel to them so that if you're on the DVA website, but then you need to go to the DSS website, you kind of already have an idea of how to get there because they all have that same uniform look. So we're really excited about that. Connections with younger veterans. I know that you're sort of wanting to try and push that a little bit more because I think sometimes maybe the younger veterans are a little bit disconnected. Yeah, I think as the commissioner mentioned, we are definitely an older state here in Connecticut and our veterans have, there's just such a wide range from 17 to over 100. So you have to be able to reach all of them in a way that's meaningful to them and user-friendly, something they're going to be able to turn to. So we've definitely been trying to engage our younger veterans. We do have a mobile app and it's interesting because I believe that was developed in 2018 and the technology in just the last six years has developed so quickly that we're now, a lot of times people don't go to the app store to download apps. You just go to a website and on your phone and that kind of website becomes a mobile app. So we're looking to see if we can actually upgrade our app to become a progressive web app. So that way when you go to our DVA website from your phone, it's already kind of in that app format. So that would be really great. And I think that younger veterans and families would connect to that. They grew up with technology. So that's certainly something that they'd be really happy to use, probably very easy for them to use. The legislative session has started. It is a short session this year because it is a major election year, but it is important for veterans to make sure that they get their voices heard. There's a lot of detail that we could go into, but I think to keep it sort of like simple, state budgets come out. That's, you know, sort of, that's always a questionable thing. And that's something that's always obviously discussed as to whether or not there's enough money for this, enough money for that sort of thing. So, I mean, you know, the the governor and obviously the legislator pass biennial budgets. Then, of course, you know, there's the creation of laws, which clearly the Department of Veterans Affairs, they help to craft them with obviously legislators. The important thing I really want to get across is that it isn't about just everything that you do as as an agency. Veterans need Again, we've mentioned this throughout the podcast, veterans need to have their voices heard. So what should they be doing more of if they're not doing it already? Right. And and I think that's a great point. And that's certainly something that I really wanted to get across in this podcast is how we can all play a piece in crafting legislation and laws that further advance veteran programs, services, again, supporting our veterans as well as their families. So much of what happens, if not all of what happens here in our state and federally is done through the legislative process. So when there is an issue, it's done or it's corrected or it's advanced on a legislative level. So for veterans to to get involved in family members, it's really important to be an active piece in that change. And one of the best ways you could do that is just know Knowing who your legislators are in your town, you can go to the CGA website. I'll say it a few times, but it's www.cga.ct.gov. There's a link right at the top. Find your legislator. You put in your town, you put in your street number, and it will bring up who your constitutional elected officials are at the federal level, as well as your local legislators, your local rep, your local senator, and just engaging with them, giving their office a call saying, have you heard about this? Did you know? that this is happening? Would you like to come out to our group and meet with us so we can talk to you? They're really, I have to say, our legislators here in Connecticut are really forward facing. They like to be out in the public. They like to know what's happening and what are some of the problems their constituents face. Ultimately, they work for you. We elect them and and they work. They work for us. They work for all of us. So they do like to hear from people on what's going on. So they're usually pretty accessible. So just being able to contact them is a great first start. But one of the things that I would also say is it's important to keep apprised of 
the CGA website and what's happening on a daily basis. So again, if you go to www.cga.ct.gov, right in the middle of the website, you're going to see the kind of the weekly schedule and what's planned. Each committee has its own separate web page, which you can access right through the CGA, and it will tell you about public hearings coming up. And that's really key because the public hearings are usually announced with a very short window of time, maybe five days. And that's not a lot of time when, you know, life is is happening and things are busy to be able to prepare testimony, whether it's written or you're preparing to do it virtually or come down to Hartford and testify in person. And you have to sign up in time as well. So usually each committee will set the parameters of when you have to submit testimony by. And you sign up and you testify in the order in which you sign up. So typically they'll let other legislators or State Department heads testify first. And then when it goes to the public, you're given three minutes. It is a very hot topic and there are a lot of people set to testify. You will be there all day. So the earlier you sign up, the better. But it's really great in Connecticut. We've now, if there's any silver lining from the pandemic, it's now that we can testify virtually. So you don't have to make your way to Hartford to testify if you'd like to do it virtually. And you can also submit written testimony. But that is such a key piece of having your voice heard because the more people that testify, the more people that submit written testimony on a topic, the more of a clue that is to our legislative body that that's an issue that needs to be looked at more closely. And the final point on this as well, I would just say to the people that are listening and and you made that very clear, you know, you need to give time, you need to make sure that if you are passionate about something and you want to give testimony, as you said, you're going to have to maybe consider giving an entire day. If it is something though that you're not giving testimony on but you want to find out about it it is easy to watch all of these committees most of them most of the time are actually available either online or on television through the state's television network called ct-n you can go to ct-n.com and watch it online or you can actually depending on where you live in the state as well just find it on your tv guide as well so you are able to actually see democracy in action as well on the television so don't feel you have to constantly get yourself to heart even though it's nice to pop up to the Capitol every now and again. Yes, CTN is a wonderful resource for the state and for the general public. Everything you could want to watch is there and they record it. So even if you're not catching it live, you can go back and watch plenty of public hearings. So again, just can't say enough good things about CTN and what they do for our state. Well, Lindsay, it's been great talking to you. We've like tripped through these rather quickly, but um, it gives people an idea of all of the things that are actually happening. And again, we constantly say this throughout the podcast if you've got any questions at all of course that's what the agency is here for go to the website find the details or that may be on the website or just give the agency a call and somebody will answer your question it's good to hear from you thank you for your first appearance on the podcast we look forward to having you on future podcasts and thanks as i say for taking us through all of that thanks brian Over the course of bringing you these podcasts, we hope to bring you the voices of veterans from across the state and let them tell you their stories. In this episode, we speak with Vietnam veteran and Connecticut resident Ron Farina, who for years after his service wanted to just forget about his time in Vietnam. But over a period of years, his attitude changed, and putting pen to paper, Ron has written a series of books about the men and women of the military. His latest book, which comes out later in 2024, is called Sacrifice and tells the stories of the family families, friends and loved ones of fallen soldiers. How challenging was it to write any of these books? Because they're intense books. We're talking about people's very, very personal stories. And not only people's personal stories, but of course your own memories as well, weaved into these things somewhere. How much of a challenge was it, particularly this first book? In the first book, I infused more of myself in it, which looking back now, I might have written it a bit differently. But the first book, the challenge was in finding people that first of all, we're willing to talk about their experiences. When you ask them to talk about it, you're asking them to revisit pain, trauma, them to open themselves up to the public, potentially even to some criticism. There are issues of of some information being classified 
that you've got to make certain you're not putting into a book. We found five or six people and organizations that were really willing to tell their stories. And we spent hours with my travel the country, spent three to five days with each one of the subjects in the book, and really true immersive journalism, especially the stories about the amputee clinic out in Colorado, following one of the, actually the chief physical therapist around for three days, watching him work with amputees and going into the prosthetics lab and seeing how they were made. And wounded veterans who with limb loss were really experiencing. That was eye-opening to me, something that most people never fully understand. With that experience, can understand it as best as anyone who hasn't actually lost a limb could. I was excited about getting that story told in, in the book as well. Talk to us uh, briefly about Out of the Shadows, because that was the second book. What was that concentrating on, and how did that come about? Well, Out of the Shadows came about just one very benign comment from someone who had read the first book, who will have my back, said, you know, great book, maybe a little too short, and you don't talk about women much in the book, and you do know women serve. And I said, well, of course, I know women serve. I hadn't thought about writing about them, but why not? Let's write about women. We should write maybe what you perceive as a wrong. And instead of this book just being a one-off, I went back to the Duke with a proposal to write a second book, which was Out of the Shadows, Voices of American Women Soldiers. And the thought was that this book would be about catastrophically wounded women, soldiers who had served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and really to bring their service out of the shadows, because they do serve in the shadows of men. And up until 2013, women weren't allowed to serve in active combat, but they were. And all of these women received Purple Hearts for combat action while there was a ban on women serving in active combat. The Duke was all on board. He, he funded the research, funded the book project, but there was a caveat that I'll fund that if you will write a third book, which is almost finished now. And the third book is about the families of fallen soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan. But the challenge in Out of the Shadows was not so much in locating the wounded women women soldiers, but finding wounded women soldiers who were courageous enough to talk about their experiences. And we wound up probably contacting somewhere between 30 and 40, interviewed 20. Of the 20, we were supposed to have 10 in the book. We wound up with nine. Could have been more, but some of them along the way said, you know what, now that we're into this, I can't do this. The challenge for me was gaining their trust to be able to convince them that I had their best interest at heart. I wasn't out to exploit them, that I really genuinely wanted to understand not just what they went through with wounds, but what their experience serving side by side with men was like. And some of the differences are not anything that we think about. We don't think about the challenge for birth control that a woman has in a combat zone. We don't think about the different hygiene issues that women face. There's a, a man who decided that creating a contraption called a go girl was was the solution for women in combat to be able to urinate on patrol without having to drop their trousers. And this was a plastic form-fitting device that fit over their crotch with a hose that ran down their leg. Well, the result was every woman that used it wound up with incredible infections. What almost no one understands about wounded women is the blast trauma usually denies them the ability to have children. So the differences in women and men serving in combat are highlighted in the book and I think graphically highlighted in the book. But the book also makes certain that people know that women were up to the task and served just as brave and just as effectively as the men did. Talk to us about At the Altar of the Past, that book. As close to a memoir of my life as you're going to get. It's my growing up in Waterbury, son of an Italian immigrant who was a bit of a tyrant, my leaving home early, the day after high school graduation, and trying to navigate the world on my own as, as I graduated high school at 17, trying to navigate the world of men as a 17-year-old, and then finding myself in Vietnam. When I went to Vietnam as an 18-year-old, you know, back then, people married a lot younger than they do today. I was engaged to a, an absolutely beautiful young woman from Waterbury. I got the classic Dear John letter six months into my tour, came back, came looking for her, found her same day that I arrived 
arrived back in Waterbury from Vietnam, only to discover that she was getting married that very weekend. So that was kind of heartbreaking, and I decided, well, the best place for me is to go back to Vietnam. And, and I tried to go back to Vietnam, couldn't because I had a recurrence of malaria, and they wouldn't allow me to go back. Came back, and then uh, I did. And when I came back, I said, I didn't want any part of remembering Vietnam. And part of what triggered those experiences was coming back here. So the book is about all of that, but a true rendition of her and I meeting again somewhere between 20 and 25 years after we last saw each other, only to discover that we were still very much in love with each other. And in the book, it talks about how we decided to leave our families and reunite. And the unfortunate thing was that she was a smoker and wound up suffering a catastrophic brain aneurysm and she was lost. So it's a heart-rendering book set against the backdrop of Vietnam. It's great adult literary fiction. And I would suggest anybody that wants to shed a tear or two, pick it up and read it. Three powerful books that we've discussed there. You have a fourth, which will be coming out later in 2024 called Sacrifice. What we can expect. Sacrifice is very different than any of the books that I've written about veterans and their families. Those books are, each story is kind of one-dimensional, told from the point of view of one individual. This book, each story is told from the point of view of multiple subjects involved in the same event. When a soldier or, or a Navy SEAL or an Army Ranger is lost, there are many, many people involved in what comes next. The, the first is a notification team. Someone has to tell the family, and someone has to tell the family very quickly. So these casualty assistance officers and in, in the Navy and Marine Corps, they're called casualty assistance calls officers, have the job of notifying the family and then taking them through the process of bringing the remains home, getting that person buried and settling their affairs. Well, their stories are not told. Very few people understand what a casualty assistance officer goes through. So each story has the casualty assistance officer's point of view and how they were tasked at a minute's notice to be the person that had to notify the family. Then each story has the humanizing of the individual who was actually lost. Background of the person growing up, why they joined the military, their relationship with their family, mothers, dads, brothers, sisters. And then each story has the primary next of kin who were closest to the individual who was lost, what they've experienced the day that they discovered that they had lost a son, a brother, a father, sister, husband, wife, and then what that did to them, where they are in their lives now. So these stories, each one is somewhere between 60 and 80 pages versus the 25 to 30 pages that the other stories were in the first two books. So this is a big read. It is a big read. I think one of the most difficult things for me to write about and for people to revisit is I was also able, each one of these stories, to interview the survivors of the battle in which other people were killed. In each one of these stories, an actual firsthand account of the battle or the attack that wound up killing the individual who we're writing about. One of the stories that has touched me deeply is the story of Nicole G. Nicole G was the, the young woman Marine sergeant who in the last 10 days of Afghanistan was splashed all over world news, cradling a baby in her arms with the caption, I love my job. Well, Nicole was killed three days after that photo was taken. But Nicole's best friend, Kelsey Lanehart, was catastrophically wounded in that same attack. Kelsey walked me through Nicole and her last 10 days in Afghanistan, which were our last 10 days in Afghanistan. And, and Kelsey chronicled the last 10 days minute by minute, sent me you know, a lot of documents, personal diary type documents. She chronicled every day. So she was a great resource. Her wounds wound up leaving her paralyzed from the waist down. So her story is part of this next book as well. I mean, that story alone is 25 pages. As we talk to you, it's clear. I mean, people can't see you, but obviously I'm sat across the table from you. The on your eyes, how it has affected you, how it still affects you but the passion that is clearly there to bring these incredible and powerful stories to light. 
we're very fortunate that you had that epiphany, as it were, and decided to bring back those memories and also to start writing other people's stories, obviously, about the various conflicts, which sadly we see too often in our world. Ron, we wish you continued success. We look forward to reading Sacrifice. Thank you. You're so welcome and thanks for having me. Sacrifice is due out around the middle of 2024, so keep an eye out for that. And if you want to read Ron's other books, they are available at all good bookstores, both physical and online. You can find them by asking or searching for the author, Ron Farina. That's all from this episode of CT Vets Connect. If you need help or guidance about services and resources that might be available to you, then please contact the Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs on their main number, 860-616-3600, or via their website at ct.gov forward slash DVA, or through Facebook at CT Veterans Affairs. And don't forget to tell us what you think about the podcast and stories you'd like to hear on future editions of CT Vets Connect. I'm Brian Scott-Smith, thank you for listening.